everybody. Welcome back to our show. I am very delighted to have Paul Graziano with us. Some call him Paul Revere. Why is he called Paul Revere? It's because he's been putting community boards and local civic organizations on high alert. His message is, the developers are coming. The developers are coming to tear down your homes and replace them with apartment houses. What is this alert about? It's a plan by our dear Mayor Adams to tear down small outer borough communities in order to allow the largest New York City developers to build high rises in their place in the outer boroughs. In the name of bright sounding words, force the vibrant neighborhoods. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Relocate small businesses so they can be near their customers. Create a gentle density and missing middle housing. Oh yes, build housing that is more affordable. Watch out, when you hear that word affordable, watch out. They are calling this zoning package the city of yes. People listen to the bright sounding words. They don't think, what does it mean? They are blinded by its brightness. They only hear hope. They do not research into what has already happened when those bright sounding words have been put into effect. Today, Paul Graziano is going to help us find out what those bright sounding words actually mean. So, district fixes is, is, a, is a misnomer. They call it, I put it in quotations, district fixes, like missing middle, same thing. <laughs> district fixes, they, they have this uh, uh, cockamamie, is the best way to describe it, propaganda that says, well, there are so many buildings and so many property owners that come to us saying their home is not legal in the current zoning. They wouldn't be able to build it today because it was built in 1925 and they wouldn't be able to build it. So we want to fix the districts to allow for that building to become legal. Now, I was involved in dozens of rezonings under the Bloomberg administration. We rezoned entire swaths of Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx and Staten Island, even in Manhattan, there were big rezonings that were neighborhood-wide rezonings. And one of the things we needed to show when we were asking to rezone an area was that it met a certain benchmark that a number of the buildings were, could, were, were okay to be in that zone. So for example, you cannot take an area that's 80% two-family and try to rezone it for one family. You can't do it. But if an area is 80% one family in a current two-family zone, well then you could go and say, well this is primarily one family, so can we rezone it to one family? That's just a, a very brief example. So the district fixes would remove all of the basic zoning regulations. It would take away side yards, it would take away front yards and backyards, it would allow taller buildings, higher floor area ratio, which is the size of the building to the size of the lot. Doesn't it make it uh, with this higher ratio, doesn't it allow a building to be built to the edge of a property? Well, certainly more so, yes. So, for example, I'll just give you an example. An R1-2 zone, not that you know what it is, but mm -hmm. it's a single family zone. It's one of the most restrictive single family zones. It's a 60 by 100 piece of property, which is pretty large. And it needs right now a 12 foot and 8 foot side yards, a 20 foot front yard, and a 30 foot rear yard. It is a 0.5 FAR. So if you have a 6,000 square foot lot, you can build a 3,000 square foot building. Okay? Just basic regulations. Well, the 12 and 8 feet will go to 5 feet and 5 feet. The 30 foot rear yard goes to 20 foot rear yard. The FAR goes from a 0.5 to a 0.75, so it's a 50% increase. And then if you're in a transit zone, it goes to a 1.0. So you're doubling the density on that property. And then you can build your apartment building. So these are not district fixes. These are district destruction. I mean, this is going to destroy our districts, which work very, very well. I just want to make that very clear. They work well and they work the way they're supposed to. The problem is they want to blow everything up. The, the goal of the city of yes is to blow everything up. 
to deregulate land use in the city of New York. That's the goal. So that's your district fixes. Ah, transit-oriented development. As I said, ah. transit-oriented development is, again, the missing middle. It's where you're going to be allowed to build an apartment building in a one- and two-family zone or even in a, in a lower-density multifamily zone with garden, currently garden apartments and, and, and row houses and stuff like that. Again, three- to five-story apartment buildings in these areas are, are they'll devastate these communities. Absolutely devastate them. They, they cannot absorb. There is, again, no infrastructure, no school seats, no police, no fire, blah, 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 blah. All that stuff. And you mentioned district fixes. Yes. Campus infill. Campus infill. So campus infill, another quotation. Campus infill, I briefly... That is so nice. Yes, and I briefly touched on it. So, for example, campus infill will affect low-density neighborhoods and high-density neighborhoods. Campus density could be, let's say, a garden apartment complex in Queens. Now all the gardens will be filled with buildings because the campus infill will allow buildings to be built on those gardens. Similarly, think of a NYCHA development in Manhattan. Uh, another planner did a great example. The Washington houses, which are between 97th and 104th streets, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. Currently, it's, a, it's you know, seven blocks long, a block wide. It has 1,450 units of housing. I believe there are seven 15-story seven buildings on the property. So again, in a park-like area with green space. Well, they would be allowed to build an additional 3,000 units in another 12 15-story buildings on that same property with campus infill. So it's not just going to affect the low-density neighborhoods. It will affect the high-density neighborhoods, and it will affect all property 1.5 acres or more in the entire city. That doesn't, that sounds like a lot of land, it's not. Think about this in Manhattan. A typical frontage is 200 feet on a short end of a block. 200 feet. 200 feet, a typical property is 100 feet deep. 200 by 100 is half an acre. So there are plenty of properties in Manhattan that are more than that, right? That are, that are three times the size of that or four times the size of that. There are lots of areas of the Bronx and Brooklyn that are dense that also have this, and even in Queens. But this will really affect the entire city. Hey, I'm thinking about... And no affordable housing. No, this is for market rate housing, sorry. And I'm thinking about businesses that have parking lots, and churches that have parking lots. Well, all parking will be eliminated for all new residential development in the city of New York. All new development. So whether it's a one-family home or a 300-unit apartment building, all parking requirements will be eliminated. Why? The public, and that's in your list, it's actually yes. the next thing, yeah. right? Um, why? The public reason is cars are evil, and people who drive cars are very evil. This is the public reason. And there's groups called transportation alternatives. They're the ones who are taking away lanes of car driving, pumping bike lanes everywhere, widening sidewalks, all of these things which in targeted areas make a lot of sense, but to do this citywide doesn't make sense. Again, I live in eastern Queens. We don't need bike lanes where we are. We certainly don't need neck down streets. We don't need speed limits to go down to 10 miles an hour, which was just approved by the legislature last month, that the city can now designate areas 10 miles an hour. So the real reason they're doing this, again, that's the public reason. Right. The real reason they're doing this is that parking spaces cost developers money. Every parking space costs the developer fifty to seventy thousand dollars per parking space. So think about a building in a, a fairly dense area. I give the example of a forty-unit building in a particular zone. In that zone, they have to have fifty percent parking requirements. So that forty-unit building needs twenty on-site parking spaces. So what happens? They build a driveway into the basement. They have to build the whole foundation with a parking garage, etc. Let's say each of those parking spaces is $50,000. Now you tell me, developers like to make the most amount of money with the least amount of risk. It's just a simple business model. 
The Department of City Planning says if we take away that parking garage, developers are going to build more units of housing, and we need housing. And my response was, that's impossible. Developers, if they're not going to have to be forced to build parking, they're just not going to build parking, and they're going to pocket that money. That 20 spaces times 50,000 per space, that's a million dollars that they either make an extra profit or it's money they don't have to lay out. They're not going to build more units. They're going to pocket that money. And then we're still going to have cars that are attached to these units. And their statement is, well, we're not forcing people to not build parking. People are still going to be able to build parking if the market dictates it. And our response is hogwash because people will not build the parking. And in fact, developers have told me, because I know some of them, oh, we'll put our amenity spaces to charge more money because now we'll have space for amenities in that space that we would normally have for parking. It's all about the developers, all of it. I'm just telling you, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, small and shared housing. So small and shared housing is the revital, the, re, the resuscitation or the resurrection of single room occupancy housing. The goal is to recreate SROs across the city of New York. It's By the way, Governor Cuomo's father made his billions on SROs. <laughs> SROs were outlawed in the 80s for good reason, yes. because they were dangerous, very badly managed, and again, you know, uh, uh, places that were really not habitable for people. We're kind of like the, 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 Well, so now the minimum size of a unit in an SRO will be 150 square feet. 150 square feet. Right now, it's at least double that for a unit, for a studio. That's a micro unit is 300 square feet. A typical unit is between 600 and 800 square feet that for, for a studio. 300 square feet is a micro unit, 300 350 square feet. 150 square feet, that's 10 by 15. That, think about it. That is a very small space. Oh, but we need this. This is what we need. And we're going to build this everywhere with SROs. So this is a, just a new moniker for the same SROs. These aren't the same SROs as they were 100 years ago. Well, sounds exactly like what they are 100 years ago. Shared bathrooms, shared kitchens, shared dining areas. Paul, this is wonderful. I really have to thank you so much for coming on my show, and you really have educated the job public. Thank you. Thank you so much. What do you think the audience can do? What do you suggest that they do? They need to become more aware of this. They need to become more aware. They need to get more educated on it. Hopefully I have educated some of your audience today. And they need to not give in to the propaganda that is coming out of the city about this. We do need affordable housing in this city. This program is not going to create affordable housing. We do not need this program. This program is going to be the death of our city. And frankly, hardly any of the people of Manhattan know about this. Hardly anybody of the people anywhere know about it. However, as I said, I've done 105 presentations. I've done numerous interviews with people. Uh, um, you saw the one I just sent to you yesterday, obviously. Um, uh, this morning, I'm sorry, from CBS News. So we did get covered by CBS, which was great. We still have four months until the city council, three to four months before they vote on this. So it's incumbent upon the public to educate themselves. And again, we are not against housing, nor are people against development. Where, where, who should go to? How do they say, don't do this? This will who all. Be responsible? Well, the people responsible for this, at the end of the day, is the city council. The city council can vote this down. We need 26 votes on the council. We have 51 council members. We need 26 votes against to vote it down. If it gets voted down by the council, it's over, thankfully. But if it doesn't get voted down by the council, we have only a few options. So it's best to engage the council members and say to them, what is this actually going to do for people who do need affordable housing? Really, what is it going to do? What is it going to do to help lower rents? It's not going to do anything. So the best thing to do is to be engaged and to understand and to make decisions. 
and talk to your council members, the public advocate, the, the controller, your borough president, who's 100% in favor of this, and, and spoke lovingly about it yesterday, and the mayor, who of course is pushing this. Mm. They're all running for re-election the second they vote on this. They vote on this, and they go and run for re-election for next year. They are all running for re-election, so you need to make sure they understand how you feel about this in order to see if they will actually listen to you. Back about 25 years ago, uh, there was a movement across the city for communities like Pelham Gardens and Allerton and other places, Throgs Neck and Riverdale and other places in, in the Bronx and across the city to contextually rezone their communities. Now, why was this? Because back in 1961, when the zoning resolution was created, replacing the 1916 zoning that was in place from 1916 to 1961, areas were generally zoned. So areas around here were zoned for lower density multifamily housing. The result of that was that a lot of areas ended up being uh, single or two family homes were, were replaced with row houses or apartment buildings, etc. So this was happening all over the city. It was happening where I live in Queens. It was happening in Staten Island and Brooklyn. Um, and basically, there was this citywide movement to say to our elected officials, we need to do something about this. And under the Bloomberg administration, many, many areas were contextually rezoned. Um, this is one of those areas. So I found the article that came out uh, right, oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can't see the buttons on here. My mistake, hold on. There we go. There we go. Um, the, uh, this is from 19 years ago when Pelham Gardens was rezoned, contextually rezoned. Three Bronx neighborhoods rezone. New plan for Pelham Gardens, Laconia, and Baychester. The City Council approved the proposed rezoning of 163 blocks in the Bronx covering portions of, of Pelham Gardens, Laconia, and Baychester located north of Pelham Parkway and east of Williamsburg and Boston Roads. The new zoning is designed to preserve the existing neighborhood's character with lower density and contextual districts and to prevent out-of-character development. The neighborhood zoning R32, R4, and R5 has allowed for row house development and multifamily apartments, which the planning department found incompatible with the scale of existing homes in the neighborhoods. The planning department proposed downzoning some areas and slightly increasing the permitted size of development in other areas, primarily along Gun Hill Road and in proximity to the number five subway line station, which could support increased <laughs> density. The commercial zoning along Gun Hill Road was also modified to increase the type of retail uses permitted as of right and encourage new mixed use development. The full council approved on July 27, 2005 by a vote of 44 in the affirmative with seven council members excused. I don't know what that means, but I guess they weren't there. And then underneath it says, no one opposed the rezoning at the Planning Commission hearing, and the commission unanimously approved finding the existing zoning inconsistent with the neighborhood character. Okay, So this was a really big win for your community and for many other communities. Okay, Now, the reason I bring this up is that these rezonings uh, stopped in 2013. We had a new mayor on January 1st, 2014. His name was Bill de Blasio. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like to speak ill of people, but the one good thing I can tell, say about him is he's a very tall man. Because <laughs> I'm 6'3", and anybody who's taller than me is, is a tall man. Um, Bill de Blasio made the statement that all of these contextual rezonings are going to end 
We have a housing crisis, and by the way, the housing crisis we've had in, the, in New York City has been going on for 76 years straight. I just want to make that very clear. Um, the idea that we are all of a sudden in a housing crisis is hogwash because we have literally been in a continuous housing crisis since 1948. So, uh, and we're going to get more into that. So, at the time he said, we're not going to do any more of these, these contextual rezonings. However, the one thing I'll say is, he neglected our communities. But at the end of the day, I, I, neglect was okay, in the sense that he wasn't actively looking to do something with our communities. Okay, so starting at the end of 2020, during the pandemic, Anybody remember a guy named Corey Johnson? Yeah. Former Speaker of the City Council? Yeah. So in December of 2020, Corey Johnson had a press conference that I, I happened to accidentally catch on television. And I saw him standing there with three other people saying, I'm introducing the most far-reaching land use proposal in the city of New York. It's gonna change land use forever. It's called Planning Together. And so, Curious, as a planner, I looked up his plan. And the first part of his plan was to say, um, uh, there's uh, a data stuff that I'm gonna talk about, but the first solution in his plan was to eliminate single family zoning in the city of New York. Okay. The second part of his proposal was that every community board would have to upzone every decade in perpetuity. And if the community board and the council person couldn't agree on an area to rezone, to upzone, then there would be a new city planning commission over the current city planning commission with a Wizard of Oz-like person on top mm. who would go around and designate areas to upzone if the community and the council person couldn't decide where to do it. So myself and a, a woman named Renee Hill who used to be the chair of Community Board 12 in Queens, which is Jamaica, St. Albans, Hollis, this area. Um, she and I created a, a, a quick coalition. We, out of 59 community boards, I think we spoke at 38 of them in four weeks or something like that. And there was a single hearing in February of 2021. And uh, after that hearing, the whole thing died. And it turns out that Corey Johnson was using this as a vehicle to run for controller. And we all saw how that turned out. Yeah. And now he has his own public relations firm called Kojo. Okay. So let's, isn't that a dog? I think that's Kujo. Kujo. <laughs> close enough. Sorry, close. Close. So starting in the summer of 2021, something else happened. We had the resignation of our governor. And we had someone who became governor named Kathy Hochul. Bucky Beaver. So, in early 2022, I happened to be watching the State of the State Address because I'm, face it, I'm a big nerd. And I'm one of the hundred people in the city who isn't an elected official who watches this stuff. Because it, sometimes it's important. And I actually watched it. And she said one sentence that really caught my eye. She said, we're going to get rid of outdated zoning laws that are holding back housing supply. I said, okay, so I started looking at her plan. So the first part of her proposal was to eliminate single family zoning across the state of New York, the entire state. Force every municipality in the state to adopt accessory dwelling units, ADUs. We're going to talk about those tonight. Force, uh, take away what's called home rule, right? Home rule is a very interesting thing. In New York State, most people don't know this, but local governments have as much power as the state government in a lot of areas, including land use in particular. Land use, infrastructure, budget, schools, etc. So oftentimes if the state wants to do something, they actually write a bill and the bill says, this bill shall become effective upon receiving a home rule message from all cities with a million people or more. There's only one city with a million people or more. Okay. That one is the one that they're talking about is us. Hello, this is wonderful. I really have to thank you so much for coming on my show and you really have educated the job public. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. What do you think the audience can do? What do you suggest that they do? They need to become more aware of this. They need to become more aware. They need to get more educated on it. Hopefully I have educated some of your audience today. And they need to not give in to the propaganda that is coming out of the city about this. We do need affordable housing in this city. This program is not going to create affordable housing. We do not need this program. This program is going to be the death of our city. And frankly, hardly any of the people of Manhattan know about this. Hardly any of the people anywhere know about it. However, as I said, I've done 105 presentations. I've done numerous interviews with people. Uh, um, you saw the one I just sent to you yesterday, obviously. Um, uh, this morning, I'm sorry, from CBS News. So we did get covered by CBS, which was great. We still have four months until the city council, three to four months before they vote on this. So it's incumbent upon the public to educate themselves. And again, we are not against housing, nor are people against development. Where, where, who should go to? How, how can they say, don't do this? This will who all, well, the people responsible for this, at the end of the day, is the city council. The city council can vote this down. We need 26 votes on the council. We have 51 council members. We need 26 votes against to vote it down. If it gets voted down by the council, it's over. This is Speak Up. This is Sandra Shorty. Till next time, goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.